You are listening to The Edge, a podcast for personal development junkies and visionaries living right at the precipice of oh shit meets fuck yeah. I'm Nadia Munda, an embodiment and relationship coach and a lover of all edges. Stick around to listen to raw, unpolished conversations where we explore our personal and collective edges in all their erotic glory. If you are looking for a mentor this year that will really help facilitate the next level of potency in your leadership and in your erotic alchemy process, which just means learning how to amplify, transmute, and shift energies that sometimes can feel stagnant or heavy or challenging or contract ding and you want to turn them essentially into erotic electrifying turn on and you want to play right at that edge that I like to call the erotic edge then I highly recommend checking out my new program it's a mentorship for my one-on-one clients that is all about us learning to become masters of eros learning how to work with the seasons of death and winter and loss and turn them into something, you know, from something that depletes us into something that fuels us. And so I highly, highly recommend checking out the page. It's nadiamunla.com forward slash erotic edge. We've got a couple of different options for you. We have um, the way that I love to work is a six month container. Always it's tried, tested and true. I've been doing it for nine years. Um, and then there's also a three month container. If you are someone who likes to take everything and compact it a little bit more, if you're really working on going into an in-depth immersion over, um, a smaller amount of time, if you don't have the space to go to sort of pull it out and do it over six months, then, you know, this three month package could be an option for you as well. In both cases, you get Voxer support from me. In both cases, you get the option to do a two day in-person erotic movement immersion with me, um, which also can be done online virtually on zoom. If you're someone who cannot travel, but you really want to do this. So there are so many options, but this is a combination of sort of traditional life coaching calls combined with an in-person immersion combined with in-between call support. So really it's the full, uh, what do they call it? The full enchilada ladies. Um, so reach out, take a look at the, uh, site. And if you have any questions, you know where to find me. Um, there's a direct link to apply there. That's always the best way to get on an exploration call with me where we really get a sense of whether it's a fit or not. Because in this particular program, I only take a handful of people a year. So I always love to hop on the phone and make sure that this is going to be a situation that's like win, 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 where there's going to be magic and fireworks and it's going to be the best decision for you. All right. So I hope to talk to you soon. Hello lovers, I feel like I haven't been here for so long, (laughs) which is not true. I mean, you guys are not having that experience because we roll out episodes consistently and on a schedule and we've got, you know, experts one week coaching episodes another week and then solo episodes the week after and even though there's nothing that holds me to that exact rotation, I think so far we've managed to stick to it. And the reason for that is because of a couple things. Well, one, I love a good buffet. I don't know about you, but I much prefer... I was just talking to someone about meal prepping. I know I'm going all over the place. I promise I'm going to talk about what you came here to listen to which is the void and how to survive it. But um, I wanted to just, yeah, address this and how I'm feeling, a little bit of context. So I find when I meal prep or make a big batch of something, I'm just not really, I get bored really quickly. So it's efficient, it's great, I've got food in the fridge, but I often never get to the end of it, especially if it's me alone. And so... 
I'm, I'm, I'm a girl that likes to mix it up. I like to mix it up with how I dress, with what I eat, um, the shows I watch. I mean, <laughs> I'm a diverse kind of gal. And so, of course, my podcast would be the same. So I'm like, I don't want to just interview experts. I don't want to just talk to you on my own on the floor of, you know, my apartment. I don't want to just be coaching people. I, I want to do all of the above. It keeps me on my toes and hopefully it keeps you as the listener engaged and excited to try different things. So with that said, when I record, I often record quite a few solo episodes within a few days, sometimes on the same day, because as you know, I'm a human design projector, or maybe you don't know that yet, um, if you're just tuning into this podcast for the first time. And so I have ebbs and flows with my energy and my inspiration and my creativity. So I can have a couple of weeks where I'm like, just everything is coming through. And then a few weeks where it's completely quiet. The channel, there's nothing, nothing coming through. It's a lot of like relaxing, rejuvenating, taking in. So with that said, the last solo episode I actually recorded for you all feels like a long time ago. And it might not have been that long ago. But I feel like the last three weeks, maybe close to four, have felt like a lifetime which is an often, often it's a pretty common occurrence in my life. But in this case, I got sick uh, with a virus and, you know, thought, okay, I got a sore throat. It's just whatever, not a big deal. I was surprised because I don't usually catch viruses or when I'm exposed, I just, I get over it pretty quickly. Like I just sleep, feel it trying to fuck with me then my immune system responds and then we're good nope this one got me this one got me and after a week not only did it get me but it turned into pneumonia which I didn't even think was a thing I'm like who gets pneumonia like I don't know I have never had a single issue with my lungs I don't know anything about pneumonia I ended up having to go to the hospital because I thought I had a gallbladder situation and showed up there because I thought my gallbladder was going to explode or something, um, which, you know, is usually the appendix, not the gallbladder. But anyways, I thought some some organ was not doing OK on my right side. And I went to the ER and they did a, every single test under the moon, um, which I'm both grateful for and also probably not going to be so grateful when I get the bill. And I, and they walked back in and they were like, you have bilateral pneumonia. And I'm like, excuse me, what? I think you're in the wrong room. This can't be me. Um, but yeah, turned out that was, that was what was going on. I also had quite a few other health complications that just aren't really relevant here. Uh, but they were pretty scary and they were scarier than, than the pneumonia piece actually. Um, but they were very temporary and within 24 to 48 hours I was settled. I think it was just that I had let it go for so long, which I didn't realize because I truly, I mean, I felt horrible. I'm not going to say I felt good, but I thought there was a whole different thing. I thought there was something muscular, emotional, and in my nervous system happening, which, I mean, let me tell you, my nervous system was definitely shot, but um, yeah, yeah. It turned out to be a result of, of, a, of a deep infection that I just didn't know how to flag because I've never really gotten, I mean, I guess as a kid, I got tonsillitis maybe or like strep throat, but I've never really gotten an infection in my body and I just don't really understand what to look out for. And I'm such a natural medicine kind of gal that I'm just, I don't ever go to the doctor really. It's so rare. And obviously in this situation that saved me and I am so grateful for certain aspects of, you know, more traditional Western medicine, such as antibiotics, as much as they also can cause havoc 
on your system in other ways. It's still really, I mean, within two days, I was feeling a million times better. So all to say, I've been on an emotional roller coaster. I also haven't been able to coach for weeks. I had to cancel so many sessions, all my meetings, because I couldn't talk more. I couldn't speak more than a sentence without coughing and um, feeling like really challenged uh, in my breathing. So... Anyways, I may be doing, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I'm, I, I may do another episode just on lungs, grief, and pneumonia, because there's a lot to unpack there, but that's not what today's episode is about. But I did want to give some context as to where, where I'm at, where my heart is, where my body is. This is the first episode I'm recording since being able to speak again without coughing my lungs out. So that's a celebration right there. And I sat down and got really quiet. I got really quiet. Well, first of all, I had to just be really, I couldn't even talk. (laughs) So talk about being quiet. I mean, I was for weeks just at home and can't really talk, can't send audio messages, which like anyone in my community knows that's how I stay connected, especially as someone who lives alone. And I couldn't do any of those. And so there was a lot of introspection and a lot that I sat with. And it had me thinking today that I want to talk to you all about the void. And the void, the void, the void, the space, the liminal space in between. For some people, the void is the actual you know rock bottom the death for some it's the portal from death into rebirth it's just that's for me it feels like this suspended space where i don't feel like i'm moving i don't feel like i'm going anywhere where my mind wants to convince me i'm going backwards where I just feel like suspended in a 360 degree fashion. Like I can't really get my feet on the earth. I don't feel like I'm moving forward. I'm just sort of suspended is is truly the best word that comes to mind. And I feel like this is a, you know, I mean, this is such a common occurrence for All of us, all of nature goes through the death and and, and rebirth process. I mean, it's just the cycles, it's the seasons. For those of you who listen to this podcast regularly, you know how much we talk about the cycles of nature and then the cycles within us because we are an extension of nature. And so, of course, the void is inevitable. Winter is inevitable. And this has been coming up as a theme so much in season two, because I myself have been, (laughs) I keep thinking, I'm like, I'm out of the void. This has been going on for close to a year now. And I think in the past, I've had these periods of winters, ego deaths, voids, dissolutions, but they've always been like, they come in a cute little package. (laughs) I don't know about cute, but they're short. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been in a void that lasted for what felt like an eternity. It usually, you know, comes, it, it gets very intense. I alchemize it really quickly, go into full dissolution. And I'm a very resilient person. Resilience is very much coded in me. Um, And I I don't know, I bounce, I bounce back. And something about this one has been next level. The void extends and extends and extends. And no matter how short your void may be, 
or how long it may be. Like the length is irrelevant. When we're in the experience, it feels like it's never ending because it's truly a black hole. In fact, I that my second ever mushroom journey, and I've, I've really only had like three. Um, and my second was a solo journey where I went deep into the void, where I was suspended out in the middle of like somewhere in the universe. Like, I don't even know. I can't identify it because I've never been there here in this lifetime. But on this journey, I was suspended out there in space, in the black hole, somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I wasn't on a planet. I wasn't on a star. Like I just was floating in the middle of nowhere. And the echo of my existence was, oh, bleh. I remember I was listening to God only knows why. I had to guess it made sense at the time. The Billie Eilish album, Man, I think it's the one that got her the most famous. I don't remember the name of it, but it's like, it's really sad. And so I went into this echoey, existential, liminal void of a space. And the whole journey was about me coming to terms and coming to full acceptance that I am alone in the void. And that it's equally terrifying, but it's also absolutely beautiful and how to hold my own inner little girl who's really scared in the process of that. So that was a intense one, probably like four, four years ago, I want to say four or five years ago. So when I think about the void, I think about that experience somatically being suspended somewhere out in universe and space not knowing up from down there's no gravity it's just it's it's like bleh. it's just black till the end of time everywhere you look there's only black um and so this void this chapter of my life has been void to the max <laughs> thinking about like Pepsi Max. Remember Pepsi Max? I don't know. Pepsi is not really a big thing in the U.S. It's a big thing in the rest of the world. Where I grew up in Lebanon, Pepsi. Pepsi was it. It was not Coca-Cola. When we grew up, it was Pepsi. So void to the max. And the truth is I'm still in it. And the pneumonia felt like yet another layer. And I've been in this experience of being like, oh, okay, I've hit, I've hit the bottom, right? Like now it's time to go up. <laughs> And it's, yeah, uh, we don't know. Every time I think I've sort of reached the end and it's like, oh, I, spring is peeking its head. It, it continues. And I'm getting so impatient. I am having such a hard time with it. I am spiraling more than I have in years. It's been a wild, wild, wild ride. So, I wrote down a few things. Tips for navigating the void. As someone who's still in the void, I bet there'll be like a part two or <laughs> part three. I hope not, you guys. I hope I get out of this. <laughs> So let's talk about how to source yourself, how to resource yourself when it is that difficult, when you are suspended in space and you don't know top from bottom, sky from earth, because you're not really on earth. There might not even be a sky because you're sort of out there in the middle of nowhere. And it just feels dark. And you look everywhere and it's just darkness forever. It's so fun. So 
the first thing that I want to start with is letting yourself stop gripping, right? So if I'm suspended out in space, the first thing I'm going to want to do especially if I've lived my whole life with gravity, the force of gravity, is I'm going to want to find a force. I want to find the ground. I want to find something to tether to. But the void by nature is completely untethering. And so a very organic response in our nervous system as humans is to clench is to grip is to white knuckle is to find literally anything that is floating through space and being like i'm holding on to this a rock flying through space a whatever a piece of debris just anything like uh, like something to anchor into so of course it's natural and understandable that we would do that. And step one before anything else is to acknowledge, oh, I have to surrender. <laughs> Easier said than done. And I know I'm starting with the, the, the most overarching, uh, arguably cliche concept here, but it's true. There is a lot of rhetoric around you are the creatrix of your reality and you can make anything happen and manifest this and you, if you are this way, you will magnetize that. And we also grew up in school very much being taught like, okay, if you show up and you study and you whatever, you'll do better on your test, right? So it's like, there is this entire reality that says you can change things. You have the power. And I'm not saying that's incorrect. But most of us are operating fully to one side on I am the creatrix of my own reality. I'm going to put the mantras on my mirror. I'm going to do this and I'm going to be so positive and then all the pos and then I'm going to be a millionaire and then it's all going to, right? Or, oh, shit's not working. I have to figure out how to fix it. What's wrong? What am I doing wrong? What's wrong with the business model? What's wrong with this offering? What's wrong with the copy? What's wrong with the photo shoot that I did? What's wrong with my relationship? What's wrong with my face? What's wrong with my ass? What's wrong? You know, right? Like we just keep going. We try to find like what's wrong in order to fix it because that still gives us a sense of control. Oh, once I identify the problem, I can go fix it. And that's all based on this philosophy that you are the creatrix of your own reality. And you are the creatrix of your own frame, of the lens through which you, sh you see the world. But you're not necessarily the creatrix of your circumstance. So I want to say that again. You are and can be at any time, always, forever, the creatrix of your own reality and the lens through which you see the reality. You cannot be at all times the creatrix of your circumstance. Sometimes you can. We can make shit happen. If my house is dirty and I'm like, you know what? In an hour, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to clean it. It will be clean at the end of the hour. But if I say at the beginning of the month, by the end of the month, I want to have made $50,000, I can't confirm that that's something that would necessarily happen. All right. In certain industries, it might be easier. You're like, okay, well, it's going to take X number of t-shirts to sell to make X amount of revenue this month, right? And that can be a little bit more controlled. But in particular, when you're working in certain areas like our you know, entrepreneurship and coaching and when it's a lot more like service-based, it, it gets a little wonkier. 
So full acceptance that your circumstances are partly being dealt to you and that even if you intend to do something, you don't have full control. Because life is going to throw you curveballs. Life is going to give you the circumstances that allow for you to see blind spots, to learn lessons, to evolve, even when you look at it and you're like, this fucking sucks. Like, I have not been enjoying my circumstances. I have been hating my circumstances lately. I have been resisting my circumstances. It has been not fun. And yet I have to believe that on some level life is offering these circumstances that are against my preferences, that are the opposite of my intention in order for me to evolve in some capacity that I might not even be aware of. I might not even understand cognitively at the moment. So let us all collectively stop gripping. Let us acknowledge that we grew up in a world where we were taught to control and to white knuckle and to identify the problem and then go fix it, but that that's not always going to work. So that moves me on to another tip. Creating structure. In a way, when you move into this piece, you are now creating structured surrender. I think people go too far into, oh, I just have to surrender and and then I'm just like a blob and I don't, there's no definition and I don't know what I'm doing and there's no container, there's no structure, there's no plan, there's no, there's no shape holding you in the dissolution and that is going to create a flood a flood of existential angst a flood of emotions a flood of um, hopelessness right so we have to create some sort of structure so What that means is, and again, this is going to depend on your circumstance, but it is important that you pay attention to where do I spiral? And this sort of actually goes into tip number three. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to combine them as we're talking. Where do you have the moments where you feel like shit? Because you can't be in a void. Don't even tell me you're in a void and you're not feeling like shit from time to time, if not 24-7. Where do you spiral the most? Is it when you first wake up in that first hour? Is it at 3 a.m. when you wake up to pee and you come back and now you're thinking about all the things? Is it trying to fall asleep? Is it after 6 p.m. when, let's say, you close up work and now you've got space to think or that's the time you would normally be with your partner but you guys have now split up or when is the time that your heart and or your monkey mind go full throttle (laughs) and so pay attention so first notice like okay where are the patterns and then create structure so for example for me my spiraling would happen in the morning. My spiraling would happen in the first couple of hours of the day. And so I had to create a structure where I got up and got out of the house first thing in the morning, which was different than the structure I used to have. I'm quite a homebody. When I had a lot of work, I do the best work in the morning. So I would wake up and I would stay in my house and use all the time before lunch to be as productive as possible. Now, if this new chapter of life is having me spiral from, let's say, 8 to 10 a.m., even though in the past that was a great time for me to get work done or to do some like a bit of morning practice and then start to get into work, I have to shift that up. I have to go, you know what? I'm just going to get my ass out of the house in the morning. 
and that can break the pattern. So create structures. Do you have too much space? Do you need to write the evening before, hey, here are five things I could do tomorrow when I start to spiral? Or sit down and, and, and remind yourself, okay, when things start to feel like shit in the past, what has helped me? What are the things that help soothe me? Phone call to a friend, going to a yoga class, taking a nature walk, doing, you know, whatever is your thing, embody class, putting on a particular playlist. Like I've been finding so much comfort in listening to music from the 90s these days for me. I've been listening to a lot of what I listened to in high school. There's just a way in which the music held me at that time when I also was in a different kind of void where I didn't know who I was, where I was in, you know, teenage years are, we're such an identity shift. We're figuring out who we are. We're blossoming into an adult. And most of the time when you're in the void, you're going through either an identity shift or a crisis of faith or a complete realignment of your values, a complete shift in how you see the world or how you move through the world. Like the gear shift may change from like, let's say, go, go, go. You've been productive your whole life. You've been efficient. You work, you know, 60 hours a week and da, da, to like, oh, I want to soften. I want to, I'm, you know, and I'm seeing that, right? Like we all are seeing that in the collective. Everyone is like, slow down take more time outside, you know, all of which are very good. So when do you spiral and then create a structure that helps support minimizing the spiral? I'm not telling you it's going to go away. The existential angst remains. There's going to, it's a shitty time in your life. Like it is a hard fucking time and that's okay. So permission to also be like, you know what? Things just suck right now. And I'm not going to be able to do what I normally do or at the pace or level or excellence or mastery that I normally do it at. A lot of the tools that used to work for me, maybe I need to do way, way more, or there's some that need to go even deeper, or I have to find new tools. Like that's going to happen. Okay, here we go. Another tip. And this again, uh, is very classic (laughs) nature using the medicine of nature now you're like okay Nadia heard that heard I've heard that a million times yeah 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 true but we have to remember why it's classic because we are of nature and we are the only ridiculous species of animal that decided that we have to pay for our existence literally have to pay rent to exist. This in itself is bizarre. The ants aren't paying rent. The bees aren't paying rent. The flowers aren't paying rent. The lions aren't paying rent. So they have less uh, urgency and scarcity (laughs) issues than we do. Now, they have urgency when there's an actual predator. No urgency around making enough money to pay rent. Or am I a millionaire yet so that I can show it off on Instagram and show off my infinity pool? Obviously not. So coming back to the simplicity of nature and each person's going to have their own thing. My thing has been weeding my tiny little garden. You guys, I have for the first time ever an apartment that has this little plot of like the cutest, it's just the cutest garden ever. If you follow me on Instagram, I post in my stories all the time because it is just the most darling, tiny, like truly the tiniest little garden you'll ever see, but really well Whoever landscaped it back in the day or first planted all the the flowers is just gorgeous. And so I have to do pretty consistent weeding 
trimming, learning how to do all those things for the first time as a city girl who never had anything I had to tend to. So I go out and I get on my knees, I get my feet right into the earth, I do wear gloves because, you know, thorns and things. And uh, I get up in there and I start weeding. And it feels great, even just 20 minutes of weeding and I, I feel better. So whether you're sitting, hiking, running, climbing a tree, get yourself out there. There are so many frequencies, vibrations, coding out there that we don't even understand that help us. So we could be like, well, I'm just sitting under a tree in the park. Like, yeah, I mean, it feels nice, but like, what's happening? Like, it's not, it just feels too simple because just because we don't know, we don't know all the different mechanisms that are happening, not only in your nervous system, but your microbiome, your who knows, like from a vibrational standpoint, there's so much that could be happening. So if you're just sitting there staring at waves coming, you know, like just crashing on the beach, you may be like, oh, I'm just wasting time sitting here looking at these waves, like flowing in and out. And like, what is the point of this, right? Like capitalism wouldn't be like, that's a good productive use of your time. But we all know, we all feel better when we've done that, unless you have some sort of wave trauma, if you've, or swimming trauma, but right, like for most of us, we watch that and we feel better pretty quickly within a few minutes. There's a lot happening we're not aware of, a lot. So let's go back and go through it. One, stop the illusion that you can control everything, stop gripping and slowly melt into surrender. Two, create structure so that your surrender has a container. Three, notice when are you spiraling? When, what are the patterns and how can you change them? What do you need to support the times in which you feel down, sad, frustrated, hopeless, terrified? And then make sure you are getting your ass out into nature at least once a day in some capacity. For me, sometimes that's literally just walking three feet outside to my garden. That's okay. It's still outside. And then next, this is one of my favorite. I call this the starfish practice. When all goes to shit and nothing's working, lay down on the floor, ideally outside on the grass, but you know, the floor of your apartment works great too. Lay down on the floor, starfish your whole body and sob. Just let it all move through you until you have tired yourself out and you need to nap. Total... I mean, that is ultimate surrender. It is mastery, alchemical transmutation, because crying is one of the best ways that we can transmute energy. And let the earth hold you while you are, let her help you with that alchemical process. I'll be recording soon a meditation that is all about alchemy. And it can be used in moments like these to take fear, pain, intense emotion and alchemize it into erotic aliveness. So that's coming up soon on the podcast as a solo episode as well and as a tool that you can we'll probably post on Instagram and on the website and whatnot. But this is the beginner sort of, a, what are those books called? The Dummy's Guide to, or something like that. You know, that whole series. It's the most basic beginner version of alchemy. 
lay on the floor and cry. But everything open, right? Not in a little like fetal position, but open. And the final piece here is about remembering dragonfly and butterfly medicine. And I'm going to address what that is. Most of us have heard butterfly medicine, right? The whole idea of the caterpillar that turns into goo and then becomes a butterfly. And so the void is that dissolution. It's that place in between where that's happening. But did you know, and I learned this uh, from, a po- from a podcast, actually, um, that was... Uh, the Deja Blue Deja Blue podcast with Zach Bush and Richard Rudd. And I was listening to that and I can't remember which one of them spoke about the dragonfly, but I didn't even know this. The dragonfly is a nymph for half of its life living underwater as a predator. And like I went and YouTube that shit and the nymph is ugly as fuck. Like the nymph, the nymph does not look good. Like the nymph looks scary. None of us are going to look at a nymph and be like, oh my God, it's so cute. It's so pretty. Look at it sparkling. Like, no, it is. And then one day it climbs up a piece of grass, right? That's shooting out of the water and it just sits there. And within a few hours, the entire exterior skeletal like skin breaks open. Like there's a whole new spine inside with the, the, you know, the, uh, wings and the cute sparkly stuff that we now like and and out comes a dragonfly and it instantly flies away and now it is no longer living in water it is like a whole different creature with a whole different skeletal system a whole different set of powers of what it can and can't do including flying and that happens in a matter of hours and so we have to remember that we have certain coding of evolution inside of us, right? And this is what they were talking about on this panel, on this podcast. Like so much is happening for that nymph in the, you know, the final periods before it just cracks open and becomes a dragonfly. So on the outside, it looks like so sudden, the same way the butterfly looks very sudden as well. But the truth is, it's all happening unseen under the skin. And so for us in these periods of void, we have to remember that we too as nature have coding where we can be a completely different human. And I'm not selling you that you're necessarily going to be a different, completely different human after a period of void. But there's a lot going on under the surface that we can't see that is going to actualize and materialize in the form of a different way of operating, a different worldview, a different set of habits, a different set of values, right? Like a different magnetic field, a different aura, a different, like there's so much that can shift from a period of void. Let me tell you, I can't wait till I figure out what, what's gonna go on with mine because this has been crazy long. I do not like it. I'm a no to it. <laughs> I'm super resistant, but I continue to try to show up day after day and just go one fucking day at a time, which is the other tip I have, because I think a lot of dangerous rhetoric in the spiritual community is this idea of, and then you hit rock bottom and then overnight, like a you have a 180 degree shift like the dragonfly and the nymph, right? And suddenly the next day you wake up and you launch something and now you are a millionaire. Because we have, you know, we went through this phase in coaching and marketing where we were taught to write our story as a like before after. Like I was, you know, broke, single and sucked. <laughs> And then when I did this thing, once I found the solution, now uh, my skin glows and I got married and I, you know, make 100K months. 
So it's like there's this this framework that we got sold over and over again. And now we feel, whether it's conscious or not, we feel sad when it doesn't happen to us, when there isn't such an extreme transformation, when the truth is the deep, sustainable transformation is slow and steady, slow and steady, slow and steady. Every country, every company that has ever grown at an insane rate often crashes if it does not have the pillars and the foundation for it to stand on that level of growth. And so most of us are more often than not going to have slow, steady growth. And occasionally we may have growth spurts and occasionally we may have a moment of the dragonfly or the butterfly, but we cannot assume that every time we're going through a hard chapter that it's necessarily going to mean, okay, I have hit rock bottom and now I am the phoenix rising and within, you know, X number of days, months, years, I'm going to, there's nearly an expectation ingrained in here that now everything's going to change and now everything's going to be great. When that's not the case, for some of us, our circumstances stay really hard and painful for a long period of time. And there's no explanation. It's not that you don't know what you're doing. It's not that you don't, you know, you have negative energy. It's not that you're not knowing how to manifest. It's not that you're misaligned. You are just dealt a certain set of circumstances in this lifetime. We, none of us can even presume to know why. And this is, I mean, for a whole nother episode, you guys. Oh, I've got, yeah, I guess there's some things that have been percolating in my system, but like there is some there's some fucked up shit that we got sold in the spiritual personal development coaching world um, around circumstances. And there's a lot of pressure on ourselves to, again, go back to the first piece of being the creatrix of your own reality and necessarily changing your circumstances. A lot of people work really fucking hard to change their circumstances and they are unable to and it's not because they're not trying it's not because they're misaligned it's not because of any of those things i just mentioned it is because there are certain systemic issues that work against you if you are of certain identities be it race ethnicity social class gender identification uh, sexual orientation. I mean, there is a million ways in which certain people have a leg up and certain people are going to have a rougher time. There's also your personal karma. There's what are the circumstances that I have to navigate in this lifetime, which may be a ton of loss. It may be working with a completely unfair system where you get incarcerated when you're innocent. It may be that you are in a circumstance where your husband dies and you have X number of children and you're trying to work three jobs while having health issues during a recession. Is that because you're not aligned? Anyways, I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole. It's a whole nother episode. But there is a lot of bullshit that we've been fed under the guise of spiritual laws, so to speak, that are total bullshit. So all to say, don't fall for that crap. Know that, yep, Sometimes hard circumstances may go on for a while. So how can I be okay? You don't have to be thriving. Ideally, you're thriving. But how can I at least be okay if this void continues? Like I've been asking myself, okay, so I've been living off of the hope that this is near the end. This is near the end because everyone says, well, now you've hit rock bottom. It's only, you know, I see you rising and, you know, and, and it comes from a good place, right? Like people are trying to hold a beautiful vision for me, but it's like, well, 
maybe. And what if this void continues for another year or two or 10? That is a possibility. It just is. And if that's the case, how can I be okay? Even though that's happening, even if that's a possibility, not, oh, I'm going to be okay until or only if it gets better. Because our safety, our regulation on a mastery level should not depend on circumstance. Our perspective, our faith, our connection to the divine should not be connected to circumstance. And this is where I'm getting schooled. It's like, okay, if life strips away all of your preferences, can you still be connected to the divine? Something to sit with. Okay, I'm sending you all so much love. Everyone who is in a place of navigating, drowning, <laughs> I'm sorry if you're drowning. I really understand. Or maybe you're prancing through the void. Good for you. Please let us know. Shoot me a DM if you have tips to add. What are some things that helped you navigate the void? And my prayer for you is that some of these pieces be helpful and give you a little bit more of something to sink into because these periods are hard and we do have to come back to the basics and the classics. And so hopefully these classic tips are helpful. I'll talk to you all soon. Bye. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening. We would love for you to rate and review the show, and I'd love to know your takeaways from the episode. You can do that by DMing me on Instagram at Nadia Munla.